Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Searchlight Church Online. I ask you right where you're at to stand, and let's worship together today. Lord, thank you for this privilege of coming and worshiping you together today, and we ask, Lord, that you would receive our praise, open up our hearts to everything you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together.
Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free and deep. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, he has a ransom. Oh, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died.
Right there in your home, just close your eyes, just close yourself in with the Lord today. We worship you, Lord. We build our lives on you. Worthy is your name. rest in your presence today, God. Holy, holy.
stand upon a name that's above all names. Faith is a strange thing. Sometimes we, we think it's, it's who we are when we're praying for someone rather than who we're praying to for that person. I had to get called into a hospital uh, situation. Family was called in. Somebody that I knew, she's a tough girl, biker, just crazy girl. And um, she registered the second highest sugar ever recorded in the hospital. And they had called the family and just saying there was no hope. And uh, they called me and asked me to come and pray. And I, I got to be honest, I didn't have a whole lot of faith in me at the time because they were just saying all this bad stuff. And we just stood around her bed and I put my hand on her head and just started praying in the name of Jesus. And when we got done praying, just out of the depth of her soul, she goes, I'm not dead yet, <laughs> and opened her eyes. And I realized then, and everybody was shocked, that the power of God, it's not about us so much, but in who we pull that power from. And you may be going through something that somebody's already you've already given up, or people have given up on you, or whatever it might be. But there's power in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just come to you right now and we stand not in our own strength or our own flesh, but we stand in the power and the authority of that name that is above all names. And we pray for every situation, God, that that all of us may be in right now, that we think it may be even hopeless. And we call out in the name of Jesus for healing for correcting situations that people have given up on. Lord, you can do it all. So I just ask right now in that name that is above all names that you'd minister to each one here, strengthen us and give us a story to tell about our faith in the one who is able, Jesus, the name above all names. And in that name we pray, amen.
Hey, good morning, guys, and welcome to Searchlight Church. I am so glad you logged on today. If I haven't had the chance to meet you in person, my name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here at Searchlight Church, and I got the privilege of giving you a couple of announcements today. First and foremost, let me just say thank you for logging on. We're so glad you're here. And if you're watching, go ahead and leave us a comment. Let us know that you're watching. Feel free to interact with the sermon and, uh, and let us know if you've been enjoying it. We are so excited to be in the middle of the series we're in. But before we get to that, just a couple housekeeping things. If it's your first time with us, we'd love to connect with you. Just say, hey, thank you for logging on today and connect with you if there's anything we can do for you. Right in the description of this video is a link that says connection card or get to know us. And if you want to fill out as much as you feel comfortable, we'd love to be praying for you, connect with you, help you take your next steps in your faith. Uh, and just to let us know you're here because we don't want anyone to ever not be noticed or feel like they're slipping through the cracks. So go ahead. You can fill it out while I'm talking right now. It won't close this window. I'll open a new one. And uh, that's where you can let us know if it's your first time or you're a regular attender and you're just letting us know, you know, you weren't able to make it in person. So you're watching online. Uh, if you need to take your next steps in your faith, the weather's getting warmer, which means beep beach baptisms will be coming soon this summer. We're so excited for that. Uh, if you'd like to serve at Searchlight Church, you can let us know there. Or maybe the most important thing you can do is let us know how we can pray for you. Uh, we know that life is tough and sometimes things uh, feel really isolating. And we want you to know whatever you're going through, please don't go through it alone. We as the church would love to be praying for you if there's something we can do for you. Let us know on that connection card. That's what we love to partner with you uh, and help you get through that situation. And of course, if God did something cool, you can tell us about that too. We love to celebrate at Searchlight Church. So just make sure you fill out your connection card. It's a really important part of the online community. And, uh, and we, want, we want to notice you. We want to say thank you. And we want to be able to help you take next steps in your faith. So uh, there's not really many announcements today. You may notice I'm a little bit sunburned. And uh, that's because yesterday we had our egg search at Long Branch. It was so much fun. Over 20,000 eggs, hundreds and hundreds of people came out and they got to have a great time. I love that our church is not just a church in a community, it's for a community. We love Long Branch, so thank you for all of you who give, who volunteer. Uh, you can check out the upcoming videos. They'll be on our Instagram, on our Facebook. Uh, make sure you go through those albums, like them, comment, share them. Uh, if you took some good pictures and you didn't get a chance to post them yet, tag us at Searchlight Church. We want to enjoy those pictures along with you, but thank you for making our annual egg search a great success, and we hope if you tuned in uh, for the first time from our egg hunt welcome and uh, if we can do anything for you as a church we'd love to help you grow in your faith so thank you guys for another successful egg hunt even being flexible having a post easter egg search was a little strange but man we had a good time so thank you for all of you who made that happen we're gonna move into our time of giving at this point and so if you'd like to participate in that you can do it a couple ways please don't feel any compulsion to give but if you'd like to support the mission of searchlight church which is simply to reach and teach people to live in love like jesus every single dollar given is only for that to reach and teach people. And so uh, if you'd like to participate in giving, you can do it a couple ways. You can drop a check or money order in the mail and send it to our P.O. Box. That's Searchlight Church, P.O. Box 338 in Long Branch, New, New Jersey, which is 07740. You can go to our website, searchlightchurch.com, click the Give tab, and give securely through PayPal. Or maybe the easiest way is to download the Tidely app right to your smartphone, find Searchlight Church there, and you can give anytime, anywhere from your smartphone, tablet. You can even set up recurring giving so you never forget to honor God with what he's blessed you with. So uh, go ahead and do that. And again, just thank you for partnering with us. That's how we can have hundreds of people from the community come to a 100% free event and just have a good time, make some memories, hear about people who love them. Uh, and that's what the church is meant to be, as well as send 27 missionaries around the world, as well as rent a place in Long Branch. Just the things that you give to you have no idea how far that money goes because when we hold on to our money in our hand that's the most it'll ever be man when we open our hand and let god use it what is in our hand that's the least it'll ever be when we let it go who knows how far he'll take it so thank you for giving let me pray for you at this time and we'll move on with our service so god thank you so much for today thank you for the great uh, egg search yesterday thank you god for the opportunity to hear your word and be a part of what you're doing in long branch and monmouth county and beyond and so whoever's listening wherever they're listening whenever they're listening god would you speak to them right now would you bless them god would you provide for every need they have and most of all god would you do what you want to do in us so bless us as we give Open our hearts to receive everything you have for us and use us to make a difference where you've placed us for your kingdom, for your glory, and for our good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, leave a good comment, like a really exciting one that Pastor Chris would love to read when he gets online and reads them himself, because he's bringing week two of our series, Happiness is a nine level. You guys look good. 
It's good to be in God's house this morning, and uh, so welcome, welcome. If it's your first time today, welcome to Searchlight. We're glad that you're here, and uh, as Tim said, my name's Chris. I'm the lead pastor, and I get the privilege of sharing God's word with you today, and so we're glad that you're here. Hope that you met some great people already. If those of you that are watching online, welcome, and we're glad that you're worshiping with us as well today. So last weekend, Pastor Tim did a great job uh, kicking off a new series uh, that we're in called Happiness is a Nine-Letter Word. How many of you guys were here last Sunday? And I hope that it encouraged you. And uh, today I'm going to continue that series, which is, is based on several Bible verses that can be found in Paul's letter to the first century church in the city of Galatia. And, uh, and so over the next month and a half or so, we're going to be looking at what is known as the fruit of the Spirit. How many of you have heard of that before, right? In Galatians chapter 5, there's a list of things that God wants to develop in our hearts and in our lives. And so if you missed the message last week, you can catch that up on YouTube. But Tim did a great job getting us kicked off last Sunday in the right trajectory, talking about the very first thing that the Spirit of God wants to develop in our lives, and that's love, right? The very most kind of important thing that he wants to develop. And he opened up the series, he made the argument that all of us as human beings are pursuing happiness in our lives. Remember that? And that's why we're calling this um, uh, happiness is a nine-letter word. And as followers of Jesus, the truest happiness uh, that can be found in this life is discovered, I believe, in living and loving like Jesus, in learning how to have that love for other people in us. And at the conclusion of the message, uh, Tim challenged us that if we truly want happiness in this lifetime, the best way to start is not by living by the golden rule. So many of us have heard that, right? The golden rule, but something that you might have heard, to, uh, heard referred to as the platinum rule, which is based on Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, which is basically love everybody always, right? It's more than just love people the way you want to be loved, but it's love everybody always. And, uh, and so that's the first and most foundational fruit of the Spirit. In other words, out of love, guys, flows everything else, right? That's why Paul said it. These are the fruit of the Spirit that's developed in you. Love is the first one, and out of that, everyone, everything else flows. So I want you to grab your Bible and open up with me this morning to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to read these, these fruits again, starting in verse 22, and we're going to read down through verse 26. It says this, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, okay? This is the fruit that God produces in our lives, love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Look at verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and have crucified them there. And since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another, right? The fruit of the Spirit. So before we go any further, would you just bow your head with me and let's pray this morning. God, would you just have your way as we open up your word this morning? God, speak to our hearts, speak to our lives this morning, God. Let us know exactly who you want us to be and how you want us to change, and we'll give you all the thanks for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. amen. So before I dig into the message, I want to give some context so, we, so, you know, it's important when you're reading the Bible to understand context. What was happening? What was going on in that time? And Paul had started this church in Galatia. He put some leaders in place, and then he moved on. Paul was a missionary so he, and a church planter. So he started this church. He got some leaders going, and then he moved on to some other places to start churches in other cities. And this letter was written to Christians in Galatia, right, because word had gotten back to Paul that the church was actually experiencing its first major internal conflict. So he had started this church and he moves on and he's in other cities and now he's getting word that there's problems. And so he's writing this letter. So the context is, and there's so much for us to glean in our lives, 2023, what the Bible is saying, but we, it's good to understand what Paul was saying to that particular church, right? That there was tension and there was conflict in the church. And here's the crazy thing. This time it wasn't coming from outside. It wasn't coming from outside persecution. It wasn't coming from people that hated the church and were trying to break it down or imprison Christians. It was coming from inside the church. And honestly, guys, if you, if you look around you today, this kind of conflict is still happening. 2,000 years later, these kind of conflicts still happen inside the church, right? Why? Because we're human beings. 
How many of you know that, right? The church, Tim always says that we're jacked up, messed up, right? Like we are human, in case you didn't know it. There's no perfect people. There's no perfect place. And so 2,000 years later, the things that Paul is talking about, they apply to us, right? And we're going to dig into that a little bit more. And here's why Paul had to teach them about the fruit of the Spirit that should be seen in their lives as followers of Jesus. Now, at, at that time, if you were in the church in Galatia, right, first century, all of the believers in Jesus could have been fit into two categories, okay? And let me explain this. First, the first category were Jews, okay? So understand what the church was made up of, okay? These were Jewish people who had accepted that Jesus was the Messiah, okay? And they were now following the teachings of Jesus. They had accepted salvation through him. You think about it, Paul, who, what, Paul what was Paul? He was Jewish, right? Where were the disciples? They were Jewish, right? So in this, in this church... Part of the church are Jews who had accepted Jesus as their Savior and Lord, right? Now, the second group were Gentiles. Who are Gentiles? Everybody that's not a Jew, right? They were anybody else that wasn't Jewish, right? And they had accepted Jesus as their Savior. Remember, Jesus said, first I came to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, right? This is a message for everybody, but first to his own people, right? And they had repented of their sins and acknowledged Jesus as their Savior, and they were saved, right? Not by their good deeds or their religious heritage. They didn't have, like, the Jewish heritage, right? They were saved by grace. Now, what was happening, guys, is so important that we understand what, why Paul would say these things have to be present in your life, right? What was happening was inside the church community, the Jewish Christians were trying to impose the laws of Moses on the Gentile Christians, this is why there was conflict in the church, okay? In other words, the Jewish Christians, so it's like if you're at search like right now, and half of us, everybody over here is Jewish, right? And you accept, for today, you're all Jewish, okay? You accepted Jesus as the Messiah, and then all you guys are everything else, okay? And you've accepted him, right? And, and the Jewish Christians were saying, listen, we know you, we believe you guys are saved, kind of. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we, we, we know that you believe in Jesus, but you're not really saved until you start obeying the over 600 laws that we're also obeying. You get that? So there's like starting to be tension here, like it's a them and us. Like, we're, and we know we're all saved, but there's a problem, right? And the biggest one that was causing commotion was that every man and boy had to be circumcised. That was a big one, okay? Circumcision was a big deal, right? Now, see, circumcision was a Jewish thing. So imagine the stress and the arguing that would happen every time you showed up at a life group meeting as a Gentile Christian, and you have to hear, uh, when is your circumcision appointment? Okay, right? Paul wrote this letter to say, he, and he was saying to the church, listen, I don't know how you guys got this far off. I'm not really sure since I left and I've moved on to other places, right? I don't know who's teaching this garbage, but this is not the point of the gospel. In fact, the gospel it means good news, yes, right? It's not the point to put all these rules and regulations on people. In fact, I'm pretty sure that, guys, if you were a Gentile and you had a chance to raise your hand and accept Jesus, I'm pretty sure the numbers would have gone drastically down if they said to you, listen, before you pray and before we get baptized, we got to talk about circumcision. I think a lot of guys, way more women in the church than men, okay? A lot of guys would have said, no way, right? In fact, it was Paul. If you remember, Paul was the one who said, follow me as I follow Christ. Remember that? Paul said that, follow me as I follow Christ. And Jesus never taught about that. He never said, like, you got to do these things in order to follow me. So since Jesus never said it was necessary, there was no reason. So with that context in mind, it's really easy to understand that there was a type of pressure and conflict that was going on in the church. It was like people were tempted to leave. They weren't sure if they really buy into this Jesus thing. There was Because it wasn't just circumcision. There were so many rules and regulations about when you could go, where you could go, and what you could eat, and who you, what you could wear, and everything, right? And think about it, God. That's why there might have been a major lack of love. You get it? Joy. Peace. How many think patience would be an issue, right? How many times do you have to hear this? Every time you showed up to church, you're getting pressure to, do, to, to obey a bunch of rules that had nothing to do with your upbringing, that had nothing to do. Now, before you go and judge the Jews, okay, I don't want you to be like, oh, those Jewish people, they were so horrible that they did this, right? We need to understand that the law of Moses wasn't just something that they learned from childhood, Okay, it's, it's about having love and compassion for each other and understanding, right? It was their entire identity as a people group. It was so difficult for them 
to accept that Jesus was the Messiah. In fact, they probably walked away from most of their family and friends in order to accept that, right? Their rules meant everything to them. How many of you know that that still goes on today? Yes? But we can still see that today. Even though they had accepted Christ as the Messiah, they still hung on to the rules and regulations. It was a way of earning and proving. It was this earning and proving that they were saved, that they really were part of the family. So because of this, the Jewish Christians, they had a lack of love and joy and peace. There was this tension, and it was very difficult for them to let go of that stuff, right? And I'll bet if I was as a Gentile, if I was in that church, I would also be having a lack of love, maybe a lack of patience, maybe a lack of kindness, right? Maybe I would feel judged. Maybe like, and, and, and so you could see why Paul would say, guys, there's stuff that's going on that I'm not happy about that we need to deal with. And here's something I would bet my paycheck on, that during that time, the church didn't seem like it was full of happiness. It's only the first century. Like it really hasn't been that long since Jesus actually walked on the earth died and was resurrected and ascended back into heaven. We're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of years. This is first century, right? There was probably a lot of people, there was a lot of people there that knew Jesus. Like they were there and they saw everything. It was firsthand, right? And honestly, it wasn't many years before this situation that Jesus said these very words when he was teaching. In John chapter 10, he was trying to explain his relationship to the people and Jesus said this. He said he was the gate that people would enter through. If you don't remember it, uh, I'll read it for you. Check out verses 9 and 10. It says this, Jesus said this, I am the gate, this is what he said, those who come through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and they will find good pasture. Check out verse 10. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. That's, those were Jesus' words, right? He said, the thief, the enemy, wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Right? And if, I, if we read those verses in Galatians, right before the fruit of the Spirit, Paul lists a bunch of things that the world kind of says will bring us happiness. We're talking about, not, right? Happiness is a nine-letter word, right? He lists a whole bunch of things that, and if you, you know, you've been in the world before, you know that there's a lot of things. I mean, you know, the world's constantly feeding us with, this will make you happy, and this will give you joy, and do this and do that, right? He lists all those things, and he says all these behaviors are the result of believing that the world can bring you happiness and fulfillment, but the truth is, a rich and satisfying life, in other words, a full and happy life, can be found by letting the Spirit of God develop these things in our lives. This is what he's saying in Galatians, right? That we have to, this is the words of Jesus that I came to give you a rich and satisfying life, right? And that's what the church is supposed to look like. In fact, I love that, again, Pastor Jim talked about joy this morning. He doesn't have my sermon notes. We didn't talk about it ahead of time, and he felt compelled to talk about, he just said it this morning, that the joy in our lives, no matter what we go through, should be appealing to the world around us, yes? Yes? It's amazing when God does that, and we didn't talk about it, right? But here's the truth. If, if you've been around the church for any amount of time, you may have noticed that sometimes the church doesn't feel like there's a lot of happiness, love, joy, peace. You ever been around there, the church before, church experiences, right? Now, that's been true in my story, and if it's been part of your ex- experience too, well, then there's a couple things I want to say. First, I'm sorry if in your church experience, you've experienced less than peace, less than joy, less than those things, right? Self-control and gentleness. And more importantly, it was a problem for the church in Galatia, and it can still be a problem for the church today. I said it already, because the church is full of human beings. Yes? It, there's Nowhere does it, did Paul say you have to perfect love, joy, peace. He said this is the fruit that should be coming out of your life, that every day when you get up, Right, Jim said it, like every day we mess it up. Every day when you say, God, help me to have more love. Help me to have more peace today. Help me to have more joy. Now, if you're going to take notes this morning, grab your note card, because this is the first point. And perhaps the saddest thing I'm going to say this morning, if you're watching online, you can download that digital note card. And then it gets better from here, guys, okay? So it's all all smooth sailing after we get to this first point, and it's this, okay? Sadly, when the world thinks of Christianity, the last thing they think of is joy. How many of you can attest to that, right? A lot of people, they don't, they don't think about joy, right? And if you think if you were to ask more, most people that are not connected to church culture or religion, they don't go to church, if you ask them what they think about when they think of church, their first response would probably be to tell you all the things they know the church is against instead of for. 
And true, right, in our society, right? Christians are known for boycotting companies, picket lines, right? Which politician is crooked? Which one is the man or woman of God for this hour, right? They, they, they might say that if I think about church, I think about rules. Anybody? Religion. What you can do, what you can't do, right? Some would say the church is about morality. Like, it, this is what if you ask somebody that doesn't, right now they're out. I don't know what a lot of people do on Sunday morning. I'm always in church, but I mean, I know they go to Amy's. And I know people are out enjoying their day, which sometimes I'm very jealous of that, right? It's like they're out there and they're enjoy, enjoying their day, right? And I'm sure a lot of people, if you said, what do you think about church, would say things like hypocrisy, scandal, cover-ups, and abuse of power. I mean, these, this is what people are thinking out there in the world, right? And, uh, and, 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 um, and, and I bet that most people would not say joy. When they say, think about Christianity, think about Christians, or joy or happiness. In fact, I grew up in, a church, in the church, and I've known more than my share of cranky, miserable Christians. And these were Christians that could speak in tongues on Sunday and then use the same tongue to rip you a new one from Monday to Saturday. I mean, I grew up in church, so I know when, why, you know, we, we can laugh about it, but I mean, the truth is, why? Because we're human beings, right? We're not going to have it all perfect, and God, and, and and, uh, and, and remember what we read earlier. Jesus said this, right? He said that he came to give us a rich and satisfying life, right? I think the biggest shame of all is that Jesus came so that we could have abundant life, not so that we could have misery, not that we could be angry or frustrated, but he came to give us abundant life. And what that says to me, guys, is that God cares about happiness. Now, it, that doesn't mean that God's primary goal for your life is your happiness, okay? Understand that. I didn't get up here and say that God's up there on his throne, and he's just thinking, all I want is for Jim Bova to be happy. We know that's not true. The God's primary goal is not for our happiness, right? Um, but, it's, but it says that he came to give us a rich and satisfying life. Now, how many of you know that God does care about our happiness, he does care about our joy. He does care that we have a rich and satisfying life. In fact, if you read through the Bible, there are many passages where joy and happiness are mentioned. Let me throw a few out really quickly. They're, they're listed in your notes, okay? But I'm just going to throw them out. Luke chapter 2, verse 10, when Jesus' birth was announced, okay, what does it say? The angel reassured them, don't be afraid. I bring you what? Good news that will bring what? Great joy to all the people. John 15, 11, Jesus said, I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. That's what Jesus said, right? You'll be filled with joy. Psalm 4, 7 says, You have given me greater joy than those who have abundant harvests of grain and new wine. Right? You have given me greater joy. Think about the world we live in right now. Gr abundant harvest and new wine is basically riches in the culture of the Old Testament. Right? And he's saying here, the writer is saying that you've given me more joy than the people that have all the things in the world. All the stuff, all the trinkets, all the toys, all the awesome stuff. And check out Proverbs chapter 10, 28 says, The hopes of the godly result in happiness, but the expectations of the wicked come to nothing. Right? When I read that last verse, right, it reminds me of something I think is so true, that the culture we live in, guys, is constantly screaming in our faces that the answer to our happiness right, is a whole bunch of different things other than God. Yes? I mean, that's kind of just where we live, right? Right? To be happy, you need more money, more shiny stuff, a better relationship, a better job, better house. It goes on and on. And meanwhile, the Bible says the hopes of the godly result in happiness, right? Uh, but the expectations of the wicked come to nothing. See, sadly, when the world thinks of Christians, the last thing they think of is happiness and joy, and that's why we need to focus on allowing God to develop those things. We talk about happiness as a nine-letter word and the fact that God does care about our happiness. We need to focus on this fruit of the Spirit so that when people see the church, which is basically made up of us, that's what Jim prayed this morning. When people see your life, when they see how you go through trials, when they see the difficulties that we go through, right, they see the joy of God. It doesn't mean that you're happy in it all the time, but they see that joy and that joy would lead them into a curiosity to say, how, how do you have that? How do you have that joy in your life? Now, if you're still with me for the next few moments, I want to switch gears and get into some super practical things about how we can allow God to develop these things in our lives. If, you, this is, if you're thinking about the, uh, happiness as a nine-letter word, how do we find true happiness in this lifetime? Here's, let me start with this, right? Three things that will steal your joy if you allow it. 
Because there, are, how many of you know that to be true? There are things around us all the time that will steal our joy if we allow it to. That they, they're, right? Remember earlier we said, Jesus said the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. That means if we allow it to happen, Satan will come along and steal your joy. That God intends for there to be happiness and joy in your life, but he'll steal it, right? And so we have to have a plan to be on guard against it. And there are certainly more than three things that the enemy can use to steal. But for the sake of today's message, I want to throw out three things that we can be aware of as followers of Jesus. And here's the first one. The first thing that can steal your joy is by allowing the wrong outside influences to speak into your life. How many of you know that to be true, right? That if you're not careful who you allow to have the inside spaces in your heart, right? How many of you can raise your hand right now and say that you don't need to use much effort to think of someone in your life who has the superpower of stealing your joy and happiness? Anybody? Right? You, you, you don't have to try real hard, right? You know what I'm talking about. That person can listen to your hopes and dreams and then crush them with one glance, not even a word. I mean, they don't have to say anything. They can just look at you a certain way. How many of you could be, you can have your back to them and you know they're already stealing your joy, right? This person could be a follower of Jesus like you and like me or a non-believer. It doesn't matter, right? The truth is you have to have your guard up when you are, allow certain voices to get close to you. That's not to say that you shouldn't have friendships or relationships with people at all different walks of life. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be connected to anyone that maybe might have a tendency to steal your joy. But we need to be careful who we give access to the closest parts of our heart. Yes? It's, it's that inside spot, right? Who we allow to take that place. Because allowing the wrong outside influences in those places can rob us of our joy. When I think of outside influences, I also think of things like TV, movies. And this is not a sermon against those things. I love TV. I love movies, right? Guilty just was watching The Bachelor last night. I don't know why. Such a show for weirdos. Okay. But... Then I get sucked into it. Movies, TV, social media. Social media. How many of you know that could, be a, that could steal your joy if you give it too much time, right? Sociologists are telling us that the current younger ge generation is the most depressed, most anxious, and most medicated generation of all time. And when I say that, I'm not, ta not taking a shot at them because I think this generation that's born now was born for such a time as this, right? So instead of saying, oh, why was it? this is a horrible time to be born, instead it's like embrace why did God allow them to be born right now for what they're supposed to do in this time. But I think the reason, one of the reasons that anxiety and depression and medication are at an all-time high is social media. I really believe it. That we're all walking around carrying this little computer that gives us 24-7 access to what? Everybody's highlight reel. You know that, right? You know that social media is not true, right? What you see, I mean, all the food people are eating and the exotic places and things they're doing, you know, right, it's only the highlight reels. Nobody posts of when they look horrible. You didn't know that, right? <laughs> Nobody, no, nobody posts when life is hard, like in the pits. Nobody posts that. We only post our highlight reels, right? And so how many of you know that if you allow that outside influence to have too much, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying I have all the apps. I'm not, I'm not saying it's a wrong thing. But how many of you know we got to be careful because it can steal our joy? You can get focused on it and allow that thing to just be something that takes your joy, right? Second thing that can steal your joy if you allow it, and, and this is, I'm going to unpack this a little bit, is believing in popular myths. Believing in myths, okay? Popular myths, right? You know, there's one thing I've learned from this COVID pandemic is the power of believing in popular myths, okay? Now, before you get crazy and you think I'm saying COVID isn't real, let me say this. Is COVID real? Yes. Are there risks? Do we have to be careful? Do we have to be responsible? Has it affected a lot of people? Yes. And for me personally, I don't have the emotional or mental energy to worry if there's conspiracy theories or the government's trying to control us. I don't, it's whatever. I don't have time for that, right? However, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to acknowledge the profound impact that the mass circulation of myths and things that aren't proven about something like COVID has had on people's happiness and joy. No? I mean, I, I don't know. I've been living here the same way as you guys for the last couple of years, right? It, it, especially with happiness and joy. How much hype and fear around the pandemic has robbed people of family time that you can't get back? The impact on our kids not being in school, 
like with their class. And I'm not saying like banging on, you know, beating up everybody for making decisions. They had to, but I'm saying any, any teachers in here acknowledge the impact, the negative impact that it has had, right, on the kids not being there. The global shutdown is something that destroyed businesses and changed the course of lives for millions and millions of people, right? And so much of what we went through was based on unknown, unproven fear and things that can't be proven out, right? This is what it is. Another great example of myths that we believe happens in our day-to-day relationships. How many have been guilty of believing someone doesn't like you just because of a feeling you had? I'm the only one? Okay. You ever worked up a situation in your head about a potential conflict and then had a full-blown conversation with that person in the shower? <laughs> and now you're just not happy. I mean, you're, you got out of the shower, you got in happy, you came out angry at the world, right? He's going to say this, I'm going to say that. Once she says that, that's the end of the friendship. And that person's not even thinking about you, right? Just like that, your joy can go out the window because of a myth. Right? There's a psychological phenomenon that's been, uh, that's been studied called the myth of pure evil. And it actually, you can read about it, it actually plays a role in stealing our joy. This happens when we tend to see the world in black and white, placing people in categories of good and evil. Everybody does it, right? And we have to fight against it, right? Basically, if you believe the same as me, you're good. And if you believe opposite of me, you're bad. Anybody been caught up in it? It happens in every area of our lives, right? Uh, tell me, like, some, whoever took the vaccinations, right? then you're a vaxxer, and if you're a vaxxer like me, we're good, and all those anti-vaxxers are evil. No? The government, you either believe it's corrupt and evil, hey, you guys believe the same thing as me? Yeah, me too. We're the good ones. Everybody else, they're the sheep. They got their head, right? They're evil, right? See, the myth of pure evil, it puts people in categories without really knowing the individuals. And how many of you know there's a lot of gray in the middle of those things, right? There's a lot of stuff in there to know. All it does is breed hate and a lack of understanding. It steals our joy. And honestly, between the past elections and COVID, I saw more Christians divided and hurting each other over just buying into this stuff. It's a, it's a phenomenon, right? People who bought into myths and they lost their joy and their happiness. If you're still taking notes, here's the third thing that will steal your joy if you let it, Okay. Simply put, the circumstances that we live through day to day can steal our joy. Living through circumstances. How many of you know this to be true? Just life. Sometimes life just kicks you in the teeth, right? And it's difficult. I remember 21 years ago sitting in the NICU for several months at Monmouth Medical with our daughter Zoe, right? She was newborn. She was born with this disease called Hirschsprung's disease. And during a simple biopsy, only seven days old, like six pounds, a surgeon punctured her rectum in a biopsy right, that put us in the NICU for almost two months, and, uh, and we couldn't even, we tried to sue the guy, but we couldn't because uh, even though he put a hole in her rectum when he stuck that thing through there, by, and it was something we signed that could happen but never happens, you know, one of those things, right, and then she ended up needing a colostomy for a year, but we wouldn't have been in the ICU for two months if he didn't do that, we would have been home, you know, the next day, and, but because she would have needed it anyway, we didn't really have grounds, you know what I'm saying, all this stuff, and talk about things stealing your joy, and it was weeks of praying and worrying and calling doctors from all around the country trying to make sure she got the right treatment. I can remember feeling everything but happiness and joy during that, right? Circumstances, right? And during that time when joy should be the biggest thing you're feeling with a brand new baby, right? And instead, those circumstances are stealing your joy. Most of us have probably been through those devastating, life-altering, difficult experiences before we, um, uh, and, and we know what that feels like. But it's not just, how many of you know, it's not just in the big tragic events of your life. It's also in the day-to-day circumstances, right? We live in New Jersey, My joy disappears sometimes as soon as I pull out from my neighborhood onto like Route 18. It only takes one obnoxious person and I lose my joy, right? Getting passed up for a promotion at work or having someone else get the credit for the work that you did. Being the recipient of someone's bad attitude or mistreatment. Dealing with the stress of raising kids and keeping your own life intact, right? Life is full of experiences that steal your joy if we allow it. In fact, Jesus said it this way in John 16, 32 to 33. But a time is coming, indeed it is here now, when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. And I've told you all of this so that what? So that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Jesus said it. You're going to have like life circumstances that stink. 
Sometimes life is going to suck, right? It means at times your joy can be stolen, stolen by allowing wrong outside influences to creep into your lives, by believing myths about ourselves and other people around us or life in general, and by circumstances, right, that we're going we're gonna to have trouble. We're going to have difficulty, and it can steal our joy. But in all of that, the words of Jesus still ring true, guys. We read it already. Here on earth, you'll have many trials, but take heart. Why? Because I've overcome the world, right? That there's a fruit that I want to develop in your life, and I've overcome the world. So as I wrap up the message this morning, uh, and it's only 11.15, so my goal today was to get you out of here at a reasonable time because you've been so patient with both Pastor Tim and I lately, right? And so as I wrap up the message today, let me give you four steps to getting and keeping your joy, okay? Four steps to getting and keeping your joy. In Paul's letter to, ch- uh, to the church in Philippi, he said this about joy, Philippians 4, verses 4 to 9, and I think we can find all four of these things in these verses this morning. These are practical things that you can apply right now if you want to open the door to allow God's Spirit to develop this joy, right? Look at what he said. He's starting in verse 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So Paul is saying, here is how you get And you keep your joy by knowing that God is near to you. So he says, rejoice. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident. The Lord is near. The key to all of it is realizing that you are not walking through this life alone. That God is close to you. That he's here to lift you up and build you up and help you through these things. Okay, You don't have to figure it out yourself. You don't have to muster up joy yourself. It's found in staying close to him. Start, pick up again in verse 6. Don't be ang- Some, most of you have heard this verse before. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, and this is all part of it, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what? Think about these things. Remember, outside influences. What are you allowing into your heart and your life? Think on these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Truth is, all four of these steps are here as we wrap up the message today. All four things that are practical that we can put into place are here Because God is near to us. If you want to have joy, if you want to have happiness in your life, it starts by remembering that you are in a relationship with Emmanuel. We always talk about that at Christmas time, right? Emmanuel. What does it mean? God with us. Not a far off God. Not a God of clay or wood or stone that somebody worships or an idol, but a God that is near to us. And so here we go. Step number one, okay? If you want to get and keep your joy which is the second fruit that's produced by a life submitted to God, it's this. You have to understand the difference between happiness and joy. A lot of times we interchange them, happiness and joy, but there are key differences between happiness and joy, right? It's so important that we understand this because it's foundational to setting our expectations in this lifetime. One author put it this way, and I'll just rattle off a bunch of these. Joy is in the heart. Happiness is on the face. Yeah? Joy is in the soul. Happiness is in the moment. Joy transcends. Happiness reacts. Joy runs deep and overflows while happiness hugs hello. I thought that was a really good one, right? Joy is a practice and a behavior. It's deliberate and intentional. Happiness comes and goes along the way. Joy is an inner feeling. Happiness is an outward expression. Joy endures hardships and trials and connects with meaning and purpose. A person pursues happiness but chooses joy. There's a lot of, how many see the difference in that? That there's, there are differences, right? We all know that happiness comes and goes with our circumstances, but joy is something that can stay with us, even in the darkest times. And if you've lived any amount of time, you know that life sucks sometimes, Yes? And if we're going to get and keep our joy, we need to know the difference between these two. See, the message of the Bible is not about life fulfillment. It's about soul fulfillment. And that's a big difference in that, that you're not always going to be happy, right? But when Jesus said, I came to give you a, a life and have abundant and a rich and satisfying life, it, wasn't, it was partially about being happy, but it wasn't about like I came to give you a happy life. 
That's not what he was saying, but it's joy. Paul wasn't writing this letter to the, to the church in Philippi from a five-star five star resort on the beach. Paul was writing this letter from jail. So for him to say, right, that we should rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, he wasn't sitting on the beach like sipping a drink and enjoying somebody coming in, you know, all inclusive, right? He was in jail, chained up, waiting for possibly his next beating or to actually die for his faith. And nobody was going to steal his joy in the Lord no matter what the circumstance. Number one, guys, you got to understand the difference between joy and happiness. Step number two, if you want to get and keep your joy, is this. Commit to living with an eternal perspective. How many of you know that can be hard sometimes, right? Because if you're like me, you only see what's around the corner tomorrow. Yeah? For some of us, it's right what's in... You ever say that phrase like, you can't see, you know, uh, what is it? The... Yeah, yeah, as far as through the trees or whatever, right? You can only see, like, as far as your, your own nose, right? You ever, like, where you, you really, you can't see that, right? But committing to living to, uh, with an eternal perspective. Now, you may be listening to this message today and thinking that I'm saying the only way for me to have joy is to pretend to have joy, like I need to deny reality, right? And people might be thinking that, right, by, by saying having an eternal perspective. But here's the truth. The message is not that we need to live in denial of our reality, Rather, the message is that we need to fix our eyes on something greater than the 80 plus years we get to live on this life. That there's something else. There's eternal perspective that we have to think about. Listen, if you believe there's nothing after this life, then yeah, go for it 100% and strive for whatever brings you happiness because when you're done, you're done, okay? But I happen to not believe that. Two of us in here do, okay? I happen to not believe that. I, I happen to believe that there's an eternal perspective that we're supposed to live our life to according to, right? I believe in eternity. That, and, and, and you need to remember that we can't get caught up in only focusing on what happens in this tiny portion of our existence, right? Because there is an eternity that happens after that. If you're to look at your 80 years like you took a giant rope and run it all the way around this auditorium, and if that rope represents eternity... Right? How big would that be, this giant rope? Right? I don't know how many feet I would have to have. Your 80 years would be this little tiny section at the beginning of it. And how many of you think it would be actually crazy if you believed that you will live this entire thing? How many of you think you might not put so much focus on this? I mean, if you just thought about it, I mean, and we get so caught up on this. This is tiny little thing about how much we have and what we have and what we have to endure and what we have to deal with that we forget that there's like an eternity that we got to be focusing on, right? When we look at our lives from an eternal perspective, it allows us to keep our joy through suffering. It allows us to remember that whatever I'm going through now is temporary and it won't be forever, Right? The writer of Hebrews put it this way, speaking of Jesus when he wrote this, chapter, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Let us run the race with endurance, the race that God set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes, what? On Jesus, right? Eternal perspective, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Why? Because it says this, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, and then you won't become weary and giving up. Why? It says, for the joy. This is how Jesus lived his life. For the joy set before him. Right? There's that word, joy. That he knew that after this suffering came an eternity of joy and salvation for those who believe. Jesus endured the cross because he was filled with joy based on what was to become. He had an eternal perspective and if we want to get and keep our joy, we need to do our best to live in love like Jesus, right? Keeping our eyes on an eternal perspective. How many of you think that's practical? Because it's really easy to only see what we're dealing with right now. And we need to do that. Quickly, here's the third step. Everybody still with me? Still taking notes? Third step to getting and keeping your joy. It's opposite of what we said steals your joy is this. Surround yourself with the right influences. It's very practical. Be careful. Remember Paul said this to the Philippians, finally, brothers and sisters, and he gave that list, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever was, is right, right? And he said in verse 9, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put that into practice. So he's saying, if you want to have joy, if you want to have peace, 
Let me influence you, right? As you focus your attention on these things and what you've seen, right? One of the things that steals our joy is letting the wrong outside influences have too much say in your heart and mind. And so the opposite is true. If you want to get and keep your joy, you need to make sure you're surrounding yourselves with the right influences. Does that mean that you say no to other friendships that aren't necessarily helping you? No. It's just that we're careful how much space we give. If you're lacking joy and happiness, get back to a regular rhythm of corp. And I know I'm talking to the choir right now because you're all here, right? But if you know somebody who's struggling with joy and they've been missing out on being in church, just love on them a little bit. And, you know, say, I'll pick you up. Let's go to lunch after church. You know, but maybe it would be good for you to go and just get back into corporate worship and prayer and teaching. If you feel like your joy and your happiness are slipping away, get back into a life group where you can get some support, right? It's important, right? And how many of you know the devil, that's what he says to you when you're feeling down? He says, don't go to a life group right? Don't go. And you need to remember that that's not, that's not God saying that to you, right? It's, and I don't, I don't even think it's a devil behind the, every tree in your backyard. I think part of it is just our psyche, right? But, it's, but I think it's also a trick of the enemy to say, don't go over there because probably everybody's going to be happy and you're going to feel, wor- feel worse. And you know what happens when you show up and people love on you a little bit and you find out you're not the only one that's going through it and you leave encouraged, right? If you're struggling to have joy in your life, take an inventory of the people and the things that are taking up your time. Swap out some of that social media for reading a little bit more of God's Word, right? Try slowing down the conversations with friends who don't build you up and increasing your conversations with God. Maybe I'm not, I'm not trying to get down on you. I'm just saying take an inventory and say maybe I've been praying a little less and going on Instagram a little bit more. Maybe I should put that in check, right? It's time to really do an inventory of your situation, right? Focus on joy over happiness. Renew your commitment and surround, uh, to live in a life based on an eternal perspective and surround yourself with better influences. And lastly, here's the most important one, and we're going to get out of here with this one. If you want this fourth step to keep in your joy, right, stay connected to the source, of joy. It's really, really important. Honestly, all of these steps I mentioned are important, but this one is probably the most important one that you can apply to your life. In John 15 and 16, Jesus was teaching about the importance of each of his followers to stay connected to him and to the Father. Right? You can go back and read John 15 and 16. He was getting ready to go to the cross, but he was delivering these last things to drive this home, right? And there was a direct correlation to getting and keeping your joy. Look at John 15, 5. He said this, Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and, not, and I in them will produce much fruit. What are we talking about in Galatians? The fruit of the Spirit. If you want to produce much fruit in your life, stay connected. Skip down to verses 9 through 11. He says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. I have told you these things, so what? So that you will be filled with my joy. There it is. Yes, your joy will overflow. There's a direct correlation to how connected we are to God. Here Jesus is saying, if you want to get, get and keep your joy, you have to stay connected to me. If you continue reading in John 16, it's this whole conversation. It's broke, just broken up in a couple chapters. He says this in verses 20 and 22. He says, I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn over what's going to happen to me, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn what? To a wonderful joy. And then he said these powerful words in verse 22. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Eternal perspective. And then you will rejoice, and what? No one can rob you of that joy. You get it? The thief comes to rob and destroy and take it away, but nobody can rob you from that joy. I want you to invite you this morning to stand with me as we wrap up the message today. I, just all across this room, if you'd bow your heads, close your eyes for a moment as I, as I wrap it up. Those of you that are watching at home, you could just find a way to quiet your hearts and maybe bow your heads with me as well. Listen, guys, the world is looking for happiness and joy in every place imaginable. A lot of people out there searching for happiness, right? But sadly, the church and the followers of Jesus are not, often they're not a very popular, uh, don't really have a popular opinion 
for many of those. Uh, they're not, the, the world is not like holding a popular opinion over Christians, right, when it comes to joy, right? The world's looking for happiness in, in every place, right? But they don't see it in us. And yet we have the answer, I think. We have the answer to true joy and happiness that the world is seeking. It's being in connect, it's connected to Jesus. It's having a connection with the one that brings us that joy. It's not life fulfillment, even though what's, that's what people think they need, but it's soul fulfillment. If you want to get and keep your joy, it's different than happiness. And yet, God is concerned with happiness in our lives. If you're here and you're seeking happiness, maybe looking in all the wrong places, but you want to change, slip up your hand real quick. You say, Pastor Chris, I, I just want the Lord to help me with that, right? Help, thank you. It, it helps me to know who is praying with me, right? If you would be honest and admit that some things need to change in your life, Right, that the, so that the thief can stop stealing some of that joy, then slip up a hand as well. Like, I gotta, I gotta make some practical changes, maybe make some changes in my life. And, and if you need help realigning your life with God's word so that you can maybe step back into some of that, right? Listen, guys, all of us could be raising our hand at one time or another, right? Because all of us need to reassess and do this. Listen, our joy and our happiness are on the heart of God. Jesus came so that we could have a rich and satisfying life. That's why he came, life, abundant life, right? And that concludes our happiness. And more than that, he wants to use our story, my story, and your story to share his joy with your neighbors and with your family and with people around you when they see that joy in you. How many of you would just agree with me today that at least in our church, in our families, in our homes, we can do our best to be a better representation of joy? right? And a better representation of happiness, right? That, that maybe if you've been trying to share your faith with friends and family members, instead of starting out with, give me 10 minutes to tell you how you can avoid going to hell. <laughs> maybe instead, it's, uh, hey, I believe as a Christian, God has shown us that he cares about our happiness, that maybe what you're sharing with me as my friend is that you want happiness. Happiness in your marriage, happiness in your family, happiness in your life. And if you want to hear what I believe are part of the answer to that, I'd love to share with you what God says, what Jesus says about that. That Jesus said he came so that you, even though you don't believe necessarily right now, could have a rich and satisfying life. You probably didn't know that Jesus said that. That he wants you to have happiness in your life but you're maybe looking for it in some of the wrong places. I'd like to talk to you more about why I can have joy in my life even when I got the diagnosis that I didn't want to get or I'm going through the struggle or even though my marriage didn't work out or something's happening with my kids, right? That I can still have joy. I can still have happiness in my life. How many of you think if we led with that, more people would probably listen and open up their hearts to maybe like at least giving Jesus a chance in their life? Instead of, let me tell you the 10 things that are wrong that you need to fix in your life so that you don't go to hell, right? And that's what a lot of people think when it comes to a relationship with Jesus. Father, I pray for every hand that went up today. God, and everybody that's at home watching and maybe thinking about this stuff, that we know that it starts with love and developing that. Then we think about the church in Galatia, and there was all kinds of turmoil, and we have all of that can go on in the church, like who believes what, and which team are you on, and all those things. We can easily find ourselves in those things, and the reality is, God, every one of us is a sinner. There's none of us that gets it right. All of us are saved by grace. None of us have the corner market on all the perfect theology, and so, God, instead of focusing on our differences and those things, we just want to allow you to develop in us love and now week two joy. That this is happiness, that, that the true mark of having happiness, what the world is looking for is not in all the shiny stuff, but it's in pursuing the fruit of the Spirit of God in our lives that we can love and be loved and we can have joy. So for every hand that went right, was up today, for everyone that needs some help with that, I pray that by your Spirit, it's not something we can muster up, but by allowing your Spirit to just be evident in our lives, that we could have a little bit more love and a little bit more joy in our lives. Say, for everybody that's home, we pray the same thing. God, bring us back next Sunday. Maybe some of us have dialed out some things, dialed in some new things, that we would be people that are marked by love and joy. Bring us back next Sunday as we explore the, uh, more of these, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen. Amen. Guys, God bless you. Have an awesome day today. We'll see you next week for part three. 
What a good message, something we all need to be reminded of, that Christians should be known for our joy, joy beyond our circumstances, right? We know that joy is based on a choice we make, while happiness may just be based on happenings, but what a good God we have. And I hope you experience some joy today. I hope you take some joy with you, and I hope you spread joy wherever you go. Speaking of spreading joy, if you like this video, please like, comment, and share. Uh, the more you share it, the more you comment, the more people we reach, hopefully the more joy we bring into this world. And we all know the internet could use a little bit of it. So interact with this video. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure you tune in next week. And if you live local, come join us for church, 240 Park Avenue, next Sunday, 10 a.m. for week three of happiness is a nine-letter word. God bless you.